You know how sometimes you hit a topic and everyone just says, oh, that's super complicated. The kind of thing you feel like you need uh, a PhD just to even start. Yeah, definitely know the feeling. Well, that's exactly the kind of knot we enjoy trying to, well, untangle here on the deep dive. Uh -huh. And today we are diving deep into quantum entanglement. It just has this massive reputation for being completely baffling. Oh, absolutely. Even for physicists, right? Exactly. I mean, Einstein's famous phrase, spooky action at a distance. That kind of says it all. It really does capture the weirdness people feel about it. But what if? What if that spookiness isn't actually in the entanglement itself, but maybe more in how we've been uh, trained to think about it? That's precisely the question we're digging into today. We've been looking at some really interesting ideas um, centered around a new perspective called motion theory. Motion theory. Yeah, it's from uh, Dave Champagne and Zero One. And their core idea is pretty, well, radical. <laughs> They're suggesting we look at the universe not through all our usual scientific labels, particles, forces, fields, but through the basic principles of motion itself. So redefining things. Everything. Time, gravity, forces, even what we think of as particles. Reimagining them all as just different kinds of motion. Okay, wow. So our mission for this deep dive then, for everyone listening, is to take this quantum entanglement idea mm -hmm. and see if motion theory can give us a clearer handle on it maybe even make it feel, dare I say, intuitive. That's the hope. The sources we have lay out motion theory's step-by-step -step explanation. And the promise is clarity, like showing how this spooky connection actually works, but without the usual headache. Exactly, without the mystery, ready to maybe see it in a new light. Absolutely, let's do it. Right. So where do we start with motion theory's take on entanglement? Okay, so the first step is to sort of reset our mental image. Forget picturing two separate little things, particles, uh. mysteriously linked across space. Right. Motion theory focuses right back on the moment they're created, usually from a single event. Okay, so their origin point. Yes, and it suggests that when these two entities, let's call them, come into being, they don't just pop up independently. Yeah. They become synchronized. Like, um, think of two pendulums starting to swing perfectly in time at the exact same instant. Okay, synchronized from the get-go. Yeah. And motion theory doesn't call them particles. It uses the term structured motion loops. Structured motion loops. Okay, unpack that a bit. Instead of tiny balls, imagine tiny stable vortexes like whirlpools or smoke rings, but made of fundamental motion or energy. They have a structure, a pattern, a rhythm. All right, so these loops are created together. And their internal rhythms, their motion patterns are locked together from that very first moment synchronized. So that's the entanglement, this initial shared rhythm. That's the foundation in motion theory, yes. It's this shared rhythmic pattern born at the same instant that links them into one unified state. And this link holds no matter how far apart they go. That's the key point. The distance doesn't unravel that initial synchronization. Yep. Their fundamental motion remains connected. Okay, I think I need a bit more on these structured motion loops. Hmm. If they aren't particles like we normally think of them, what are they fundamentally? Can you help us visualize that? Sure. Think about this perfect smoke ring someone might blow. They're stable, right? They hold their shape for a bit. Yeah. That's a pattern of air moving in a very specific, self-reinforcing way. It has structure. It has a rhythm to its spin. Okay. Now imagine scaling that concept way, way down to the most fundamental level. And instead of air, it's some kind of fundamental energy or motion itself swirling in these incredibly stable, repeating, synchronized loop patterns. So what we call a particle with properties like spin or charge. Motion theory says that's actually this dynamic rhythmic pattern of structured motion. The properties arise from the pattern. Got it. So an entangled pair isn't like finding two matching socks that were made separately. Exactly. It's more like they originated from a single complex dance move and each resulting loop forever carries the rhythm of that shared origin. A shared pulse of motion. Precisely. They aren't really independent things that then get linked. They're more like two aspects of a single, larger, interconnected pattern of motion from the start. Okay, that framing feels different. And it's really crucial for understanding why distance seems irrelevant when we measure one of them. Right, because that's the core of the spooky action at a distance problem for the traditional view, isn't it? Yeah. How does motion theory get around that instantaneous effect across space? Motion theory uses a pretty neat analogy. Imagine you have a very, very long rope pulled really taut. Okay. Like across a canyon. Sure, something like that. 
Now, if you pluck one end sharply... The vibration travels down the rope. Instantly, right. Yeah. The whole rope responds as one thing. The two ends aren't sending messages back and forth faster than the speed of sound in the rope. They're just mm -hmm. connected, part of the same physical system. Ah, uh, okay. That makes sense. So the entangled loops are like two points on that single motion rope. That's the idea. They might look separate in space, but fundamentally they're connected by this underlying shared pattern of motion, that initial synchronization. So it's not faster than light communication. No secret messages, no magic signals. It's just that they were never truly separate at this deep motion synchronization level. Exactly. Their interconnectedness is that primary motion synchronization. So. Okay, let's talk about measurement. What happens when we actually interact with one of these loops? Yeah, because in standard quantum mechanics, measuring seems to like force the particle to choose a state. Mm -hmm. It feels almost magical. Right, motion theory sees it very differently. Measurement isn't passive observation, it's a physical interaction. Okay. Think about your detector, the device you use to measure the particle. According to motion theory, the detector itself is made of its own structured loops atomic loops, molecular loops vibrating in their own stable motion patterns. So it's motion interacting with motion. When one of our entangled loops hits the detector. It's like two different rhythmic systems coming into direct contact. And what happens then in that interaction? Motion theory calls it synchronization pressure. Synchronization pressure. Yeah. The incoming loop, the one being measured, feels a sort of force compelling it to align its rhythm with the detector's rhythm. Like matching the beat. Kind of. Think of two pendulum clocks hanging on the same wall. Sometimes the vibrations through the wall cause them to eventually swing in perfect sync. Ah, I've heard of that. The detector, with its established stable rhythm, exerts a similar kind of pressure on the incoming loop to adopt its rhythmic state. Okay, so measurement isn't just looking. It's physically forcing the loop to synchronize with the detector. That's the picture, yes. Now, connect that back to the entangled pair. How does forcing one loop to synchronize instantly affect the other one, potentially light years away? This is the spooky bit. Because they share that single extended synchronization pattern from their creation. The motion rope idea. Right. The instant one loop is physically forced into a specific rhythmic state by that detector interaction. Uh. The synchronization state of the entire extended pattern is immediately resolved. It settles. Okay, let me process that. Yeah. It's not a signal flying from loop A to loop B faster than light. Correct. No signal. It's that the whole shared rhythm, the interconnected pattern they both belong to, just had one part of it defined or pinned down by the measurement. Exactly. And because they were always part of that same rhythmic structure, defining one part instantly defines the state the other part must have to keep the whole pattern consistent. You've got it. There's no communication needed because they were never independent systems needing to communicate. The yeah. shared rhythm just finalizes instantly across the whole structure. Wow. Okay, that, that feels much less spooky, more like a property of a single extended system. That's the aim of the explanation. So when we measure loop A and force it into, say, spin-up state, through this detector synchronization. You're forcing it out of a state of potential rhythmic possibilities into one specific stable pattern dictated by the detector. And instantly, loop B, wherever it is. Its corresponding rhythmic state also becomes defined. Spin down, perhaps, in the classic example. Again, not because A told B, but because their shared synchronization pattern, their shared motion rope, has now settled into a final configuration where if A is up, B must be down to maintain the original synchronized relationship. Precisely. Their shared extended rhythm requires it. So the whole spooky thing really came from thinking of them as totally separate particles first, which then needed some mysterious link. That's how motion theory sees it, yes. But if they're just two ends of one synchronized motion pattern created together... Then the mystery starts to dissolve. It becomes less about inexplicable long-distance connection and more about the properties of a single, unified, synchronized structure of motion. The spookiness was maybe just a sign that we were missing the underlying picture of structured motion synchronization. That's the argument, a consequence of perhaps not fully grasping the fundamental nature of these entities as interconnected motion, not isolated points. Okay, and this isn't just theory, right? What are the actual physical things we see when these measurements happen? In the lab. Right. It's not abstract. Yeah. When that detector forces the motion loop into synchronization, energy is involved. Energy is exchanged or released as the pattern settles. Uh huh. So what we actually register in our instruments, 
you know, an electrical pulse, a voltage spike, maybe a flash of light from a photon detector that is the result of this forced synchronization. So the click in the detector isn't necessarily a particle arrived, but more like a synchronization collapse just happened here. That's a really good way to put it. It's the tangible evidence of the interaction and the settling of the structured motion loop into alignment with the detector's structure. That really highlights the shift in perspective. Okay, yeah. maybe we should quickly contrast this head-to-head. -head. Motion theory versus the uh, standard quantum mechanics view of entanglement. Sure. So the traditional view often presents entanglement as fundamentally mysterious, deeply counterintuitive. Yeah, the correlations look like faster than light signaling. Even if most physicists say it isn't usable for communication, it creates theoretical headaches. Definitely. And there isn't always a clear, agreed upon physical picture for how that instant connection actually works. It's often described mathematically with wave functions collapsing. Which feels very abstract and, yeah, back to spooky. Exactly. Now, motion theory's approach is different. Entanglement isn't presented as a fundamental mystery, but as a direct result of structured motion loops being synchronized at creation. Okay. The instant correlation is an FTL signaling. It's the immediate finalization of a single shared rhythmic pattern across the whole extended structure. No signal needed. Right. And measurement isn't some vague observer effect. It's a physical interaction, that synchronization pressure, forcing a rhythmic alignment, a collapse. So it offers a concrete physical mechanism based on motion and synchronization. Yes. Whereas the standard view sometimes relies more on the mathematical formalism without always providing that intuitive how it works picture underneath. That's a fair summary of the difference motion theory claims to offer. It aims to provide that tangible picture of the underlying reality. Which is... Synchronies, loops of motion, yeah. linked from the start, and measurement physically forces one part to settle, defining the rest. Exactly. That's the core idea. Okay. So, for someone listening who's always been puzzled by entanglement, what's the single most important takeaway from this motion theory perspective? The thing to hold on to? I'd say the key is to really shift your mental image. Stop picturing two separate particles with a magic string between them. Right. Instead, picture a single unified system. It's made of structured motion loops born together, synchronized together, and forever linked by that shared rhythm. Like two ends of the same rope. That's a good way to think of it. So when you measure one end, you're physically forcing its part of the rhythm to become definite. Uh -huh. And because it's all one interconnected rhythmic system, that action instantly defines the state the other end must be in. Not through spooky action, but through the basic rules of their shared synchronized motion. So it's not spooky action, it's <laughs> clarified structured motion synchronization. That's a perfect way to phrase it. It replaces the mystery with a proposed mechanism based on motion. A much more graspable idea, I have to say. It aims to be. Mm. It shifts focus from mysterious links between separate things to the inherent unity that comes from sharing a fundamental pattern of motion. Well, this has definitely been a deep dive yeah. and into something that usually feels, yeah, almost designed to be confusing. It's certainly a challenging topic. But this motion theory perspective, yeah. it does offer a fascinating and frankly, a much less spooky way to think about quantum entanglement. It really does. By just rethinking the basics what if particles are really structured motion? What if synchronization is key? Suddenly some of these big quantum puzzles might look less like magic. And more like just the way interconnected motion works, the dance of rhythms. Exactly. So here's a thought for everyone listening to mull over. If we can potentially get a clearer view of something as fundamental and weird as entanglement, just by shifting perspective to motion and rhythm, mm -hmm. what other parts of physics or even our whole view of reality might open up if we started thinking more fundamentally in terms of motion, patterns, and synchronization? It's a big question. Could the universe be even more interconnected, more fluid, more based on these underlying rhythms than we typically imagine? Definitely something profound to think about. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive.